Those of you who are younger might not remember what I'm about to tell you, but back in 2010, David Cameron, who's this man you see on the screen, became the Prime Minister of the Sunken Kingdom. Oh, sorry, I mean United Kingdom. I meant United Kingdom. Or did I? The fact is that when David Cameron came to power, he had a great idea to boost the British economy. He wanted to set up something like a Silicon Valley in East London and turn Britain into a technological powerhouse. To carry out this plan, however, he was going to need help, and for that he turned to economist Richard Florida. Well, it turns out that Richard Florida is a very controversial economist who became famous precisely for establishing a theory on why cities generate more wealth than less populated environments. According to his theory, what made cities rich was that they had a higher proportion of immigrant, gay, artistic, and bohemian people. Yes, that's right, I'm not joking. In fact, Richard Florida went so far as to create the Gay Index, a statistical measure that was used to justify that cities were wealthier because there was a higher percentage of homosexual couples than in more rural areas. The question is, what does the number of homosexuals, bohemians, or artists have to do with having greater wealth? The logic behind this reasoning is that the, these types of people are more open-minded, more tolerant, and more innovative. Theoretically, this makes cities experience a much more significant technological and creative advancement than rural areas, and hence, cities were richer than towns. Yes, it may seem like a crazy theory, but the truth is that Richard Florida explained his theory in a book, and it became a real bestseller. Florida's book was actually the most popular book on urban economics for years. Although, as you can imagine, just because something becomes very famous or popular, or because it may seem reasonable, it does not necessarily make it true. And so, another economist named Edward Glazer, in a report you are seeing on screen, reviewed data from several US cities, used the Gay Index and other indicators such as the number of artists or bohemians, and found that there was no statistical evidence that Richard Florida's theory was true. So even if this theory was very exotic, funny, and kind of revolutionary, it turns out that, no, having more gay or bohemian people does not make cities richer or technologically more advanced. Now, does all this mean that Richard Florida didn't say anything meaningful? Well, let's see. Having more or less homosexual people is not going to make companies function better or worse. But in some ways, it is true that cities are very diverse environments, not just because there are more homosexuals or bohemians, but because there are more diverse people of all kinds. By diversity, I mean that there are people from all walks of life. There are very conventional people, very out there ones, very smart ones, very beautiful, less graceful, and all concentrated in the same place. In fact, walking through the streets of any large modern city, it is very common to see huge contrasts. I'm sure we all have some memory of extraordinarily wealthy people passing through the same streets where homeless people are asking for help just to survive. The point is that the city is a place with all kinds of people, for better and for worse. And guess what? That's a very, very good thing for companies. Yes, just as I said, companies can make lots and lots of money thanks to the diversity of people in cities. And by the way, so can the workers. The question is, what does diversity have to do with making money? What is behind all this? Well, this is something that is much better understood with a real example. So, let's take a look. The wealth of the eccentric? Once upon a time, a European film director had the opportunity to go and shoot one of his films for the first time in the USA, specifically in the city of Los Angeles. According to him, what surprised him the most about filming in the US was not seeing the big Hollywood superstars nor seeing the huge production crews that were out there. What surprised him the most was that if one day he needed an actor who was tall, weighed 150 kilos, was handsome, green-eyed, with a limp on his left leg and with a squint in one eye, the next day he was presented with 10 candidates who met exactly those requirements. This may seem like a funny anecdote, but in reality it serves to demonstrate one of the major economic advantages of cities over more rural environments. Companies, especially the most advanced ones, often need very specific professional profiles. For example, specialists in artificial intelligence dedicated to genetic analysis, engineers specialized in the construction of quantum computers, or even chefs who know how to cook the traditional recipes of a remote region in Asia. The interesting thing is that companies will only be able to find these very specific types of professionals in areas with a lot of people and with a lot of diversity, and that means in cities. This is what is known as the benefits of matching. Matching, like Tinder matches. And just as using Tinder in a remote village were almost no one lives is not going to do you much good. In a large city with many companies and professionals looking to work together, success is much more likely. However, don't think that the benefits of the match are limited only to the workers. Companies and cities also have more suppliers to choose from, more business partners, and more potential customers. And this is something that greatly favors the creation and development of companies, which in the end make them more profitable, more productive, and able to pay better salaries. Be that as it may, do not think that it all ends there, because the truth is that there are even more significant reasons why wealth in cities is higher than in in other places. Pay attention to this. The Specialty 
One of the most famous stories in economic history is that of Henry Ford. We've already covered it in a previous video, but the summary goes like this. Henry Ford was a pretty smart guy who created one of the first car manufacturing companies in the world, the Ford Motor Company. In the beginning, Ford was dedicated exclusively to building custom and luxury cars. That is to say, one day a wealthy individual would arrive asking for a car, and Ford would allow him to choose its size, the materials of manufacture, the color of its components, and a lot of other variables. As you can imagine, every car that left the factory was unique in the world, a handcrafted creation from the first screw to the last, almost as if it were a work of art. However, if Ford wanted to make real money and become the huge company it is today, it had to stop selling cars only to the rich and sell them to everyone. So what did he decide to do? Well, to switch from producing custom cars that were very expensive to producing cars that were all the same, but infinitely cheaper. The funny thing is that since all the cars were the same, Ford no longer needed to manufacture each and every part of the vehicle by hand, but could commission other companies to produce standardized parts for them. And this is exactly where the importance of being in a city comes into play. Ford's factory was in Detroit, and next to it were many other factories that were also dedicated to producing cars, such as General Motors and Chrysler. Thanks to being in a city, with all the factories grouped in the same place, other companies producing, for example, bolts, could establish themselves alongside them and produce bolts in a series for all cars of all brands. Keep in mind that if Ford's factory had not been located next to other factories in a large city, it would not have been next to a bolt company to supply it. Therefore, it would have had a more difficult time for the moving assembly line of its cars. This is precisely why, by clustering in large cities, companies can share suppliers, which allows them to specialize more and be more productive. However, suppliers are not the only thing that companies can share in cities. They can also share other elements, such as infrastructure. For example, they can take advantage of roads or railways to ship their products to other places, or even use universities to hire freshly graduated students. Let's just say that by concentrating in cities, they can take much better advantage of infrastructure investments. And that has two major advantages. The first is that governments have more incentive to invest in roads or rail lines where they can most benefit from them. And the second is that private companies, such as telecommunications companies, can offer more and better internet or cell phone coverage in cities because that is where they will have the most customers. Be that as it may, so far we've only explained why it is more profitable for companies to be close to cities. But what about the workers? What is their benefit in moving en masse to cities? Well, let's take a look. Employee Benefit The clearest benefit of living in cities for workers, beyond their personal preferences, is that wages are much higher, higher even when steeper housing costs are taken into account. The question is, why do companies, which normally want to pay as little as possible, decide to pay their employees more in cities? Well, the first reason is productivity. Since companies are more productive in cities, they can pay their workers more. But the second reason is competition. For example, a study that analyzed business competition in Spanish cities found that the larger the population of a city, the more competition between companies. That is to say, since there are so many companies in the big cities, they all fight amongst themselves to get the best workers, and they do so by bidding for them. The company that pays the highest salary gets the best worker. More specifically, the aforementioned study indicates that up to 30% of the difference in salaries between large and small cities is explained precisely by this phenomenon. So applying this to entire country, we could say that the more companies there are, and the more investment friendly they are, the more that wages will increase. Be that as it may, and beyond all this, there is still a third reason why the city offers better conditions to workers, and that reason is professional development. In many cases, cities are, so to speak, great universities of productivity. The best scientists, the best engineers, the best lawyers, and above all, the best companies are concentrated in cities. For a person who wants to learn a trade in depth, going to the big city is the way to learn alongside the best and develop professionally. This is something that can help an individual to be more productive in the future and end up earning a better salary. But there is also the advantage that by learning how the best companies work, you can be there and then start your own. In short, large cities have a much higher movement of information information and knowledge than other places. As an example, a 1993 study found that investors and scientists tend to cite many more patents developed in their own cities than in more distant locations. In any case, at this point, we could summarize the great success of cities as economic drivers in the following three reasons. The first is that they are diverse areas where skilled workers and companies can come together much more easily. The second is that cities allow companies to share suppliers, infrastructure, and even customers, allowing them to specialize more. And finally, cities are environments of high business competence and learning fluency where workers can develop their skills to a much higher level. Having said that, it's now over to all of you. Have you personally experienced the advantages 
or disadvantages of cities? Do you think that the massive urbanization trend might be reversed with the increase in housing prices? What do you think of Richard Florida's theory? You can leave us your answers in the comments below. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Economic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe to our channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it so we know. All the best. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.